everything you do and for this wonderful introduction and welcome everybody, those who know me and I know and those who are meeting me for the first time and those who haven't seen me in a long time. Let me tell you that I have quant counted quite a few people uh, from whom I parted about an hour and a half ago <laughs> and we, we spent the earlier part of this evening in Israel or this morning for you out there together studying some literature. This is what we do. Uh, Ari, I know that you are planning to moderate questions at the end. However, because my our tour today is taking us to a sensitive part of Jerusalem, and you may judge from the chat that if there is something urgent that somebody really needs addressed immediately, do not hesitate, stop me, okay? Stop me, I can always pick it up and just introduce the question as they come. Other than that, if you don't see anything urgent, we'll leave it to the end. Welcome everybody. And I'm starting by putting on a, my PowerPoint presentation that I have prepared for us today. So the topic of our conversation is linking memories in San Simon or in Catamon. And since I do it, and I'm not a tour guide, <clears throat> I, I do the, the geography of the place, but my focus is always the poetry or the literature connected. So in this case, you can see that I really pick the four poets, authors. There are two novelists and two poets in our slide who are connected to a very small place, actually a park in which there is a monastery in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Talbia. I will show you a larger map so you will be able to orient yourself. And you can see that the choice indeed is geared to that very small part of the city of Jerusalem, not even the Eastern city, not the old city, the <coughs> Western modern part of Jerusalem. And people who know me know that I try to do gender equality and Ashkenazi and Mizrahi and whatnot in the structure of my sessions because I think it's important. It is not the case today. I have four guys, all of them are Ashkenazim. So this session was not the time to worry about political correctness and about all sort of ideological or gender equalities. We are focusing on a small geographical place in Western Jerusalem. And can you imagine, can you even think of an equivalent where a park the size of maybe an average parking lot in America by a shopping mall because the San Simon Park is for sure not bigger than that, would acquire the attention and be attracted by four major poets and writers. I think that that in itself is a unique case. The other statement that I would like to make is when we are thinking about memories of war in Jerusalem, or when somebody will think about the siege of Jerusalem, which is a term that I'm going to use very, very shortly. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to bet that for the majority of people, when you think about the siege of Jerusalem, you're thinking the first century and the destruction of the second temple. And when we think about wars in Jerusalem, the most cases are people will think about 1967 and the unification of the city and Harabait Bayadenu, we have got Temple Mount and you know the shofar blowing and the paratroopers are looking up the wall. These are the images we have in our mind. And in case I'm wrong, I'll be willing to hear comments about that through the chat later, but I'm afraid I'm not wrong. Today, we are going in the footstep of a totally different battle. And that's the battle for Jerusalem in 1948, during the War of Independence. And this is something that somehow manages to be forgotten between the Tisha B'Av date and the liberation of Jerusalem date in 67, and somehow 1948 was dissipated in time and yet it's an interesting. So please, of course, the poets, let me call them by name, Yehuda Amichai, 
יורם קניוק, מאיר שלו is the only one, ייבדל לחיים ארוכים, who is still with us among these writers, and שאול צ'רניחובסקי, who is the one who belongs to the oldest generation, and there is a connection of שאול צ'רניחובסקי to the place that we are going to visit. So the first thing I need to do is to tell you to meet me at the Shalom Hartman Institute. Can you do that? Do you know what that is in Jerusalem? That, just in case you do not know. So look a little bit to the right of where we can see the Shalom Hartman Institute and you will see the first station. Maybe you will recognize that. A, the Inbal Hotel is not too far away from here. So will you have a meet me at the Shalom Hartman Institute? And we will start walking by foot. You can see it's 18 minutes walk. This is what I have planned for you today until we reach the park of San Simon, where we will study some literature. And let me tell you when I did take groups on this tour, and I think I have done this tour face to face, I'm going to say at least four times, at least four times, maybe more, but for sure four times. It never took me less than an hour, an hour and a half to do these 18 minutes. And this is for a reason. And even if in our lecture, just 60 minutes of it, I'm not rushing you to get into the San Simon Park. I want for you to be with me on the walk there because this is the particular neighborhood of Yerushalayim and it oftentimes happens to me that people say, well, you know, I rented an apartment there and this is where we always go when we go to Yerushalayim because this is like your Rechavia Talbia neighborhood and I know you guys love it. And, and I never knew what the name of the street meant. So our first exploration is we are going back to the years of the War of Independence, Milchemet HaShichrur, and we are going to explore how it is Remembered, remember this is the session and the tour of lingering memories, how the memories of 1948, seven maybe a little bit, are lingering in the street names. So join me, I hope you're all there and comfortable shoes and something to drink. And if it's daytime, cover your heads and let us go. So as we are leaving the Shalom Hartman Institute, making a little left immediately after we go left, we will see a street called Kaftet Benovember. Now, I trust many of you know that letters in Hebrew have numerical number, uh, values. So Chaf is 20 and Tet is 9. So therefore, this is the street of November 29th. The street of November 29th. And that is the day of what we call the petition decision. Let me, that's 1947, just in case I said we, I, we will talk about 48, but we are starting. Actually, tomorrow is the anniversary. Tomorrow will be the anniversary of Kaftet de November, the day where in New York, the very young post-World War II a United Nations is gathering to discuss the end of the British mandate over Palestine and the petition plan to divide it between a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. I know many of you talk about it without maybe re not remembering the date. Sometimes when a debate comes up about, you know, the two-state state solution. So those of you who don't believe that much in that, and I'm not discussing politics now, I'm just talking to those people. And they will say, oh, they had the opportunity for the two-state solution and they refused and we agreed. Do you remember yourself arguing that at one point or another? When you do that and when you hear somebody arguing that, this is what they refer to, to the event in the UN in New York on November 49th, 1947. It was actually a Shabbat and a Shabbat afternoon. It was broadcasted on the radio. In Eretz Israel, there was no problem listening to it because it was late at night already. 
but I heard participants in my sessions who told me we were an observant, Shabbat observant family, but my father said that this broadcasting on Shabbos we are listening to. So may I recall it because it appears oftentimes on YouTube and maybe Ari will pick up a link. It's where they go, Argentina, yes, United Nations, yes, do you remember recalling that, that kind of clip? So this is what we are talking about. So we are walking our way on a street that commemorates the partition decision. And here I gave you November 29th, 1947, and the clip of a Hebrew newspaper. You notice my language that I don't say Israeli newspaper? Because this is November 47, this is six months before the state of Israel comes into being. So therefore we are talking about the Hebrew newspaper in British Mandate Palestine that announces the state of Israel was ratified, 33 state four, uh, so many 13 against and 11 abstained. We heard that st uh, sentence many a time. Continue, don't linger too much here. I'm going to wait for the ones behind because we are going soon to stop here. So we need to cross the street and you can see Kovshei Katamon. Can you see the name of the street that I've circled? It goes like from top to bottom in the circle, Kovshei Katamon. Kovshim, conquerors, liberators, if you wish, in the other political or ideological trend. The people who conquered or liberated Katamon, so we are talking about occupying Kibush of the West Bank. We are talking about those terms from 67, but even in 48, you use the term when certain parts of the Western city were conquered, liberated, so we need to commemorate the fighters of Katamon really fighting one house to the next. I want to remind you that Katamon at the time was a wealthy Arab neighborhood. And you can even see through the fence of the house in this picture that there were very beautiful villas that belonged to Arab citizens who after 48, of course, left this part of the city, either went to the eastern side of the city that became Jordan or left for other countries. So we are remember, remembering the people who liberated, conquered, fought for this neighborhood of Jerusalem. By the way, why was it so important? Because indeed, there is a relatively large a Arab population living here amongst the earlier Jewish neighborhoods like Rechavia and then Telpiot on the other side where Agnon lived. So there was a need to unite the city to connect these neighborhoods and Katamon was essential. Let me take you to the next one. Can you read the name with me? Haportzim Street to break through. So this is about a certain type of fight that did not happen here, but did happen in 48. And it is remembered in a street here, while the monument you will recognize maybe as you're driving up to Jerusalem from the airport, from Ben Gurion. And I know how keen you are to get to your hotel with all the jet lag and everything after the fight, but you may not notice on the left-hand side of the highway as you are climbing and almost at the castle, you will see this monument. This is in commemoration of the people who fought to break through the siege around Jerusalem so that ammunition, food, medication, water, <coughs> could be brought into the city. So we remember them. The memories are lingering in the city itself. Let's do another one. Hashayarot, the convoys street. So these two are connected to one another, Haportzim and Hashayarot. <coughs> they needed to break through. 
they, they needed to put together convoys with all the stuff that Jerusalem needed and to travel protected by Palmach fighters. Shayrot are convoys, so we remember those as well, traveling all the way uphill to Yerushalayim to bring, as I said, food, ammunition, medication, and even water, even water from a, the coastal plain all the way to Yerushalayim. Now comes a part that is sort of very close to my heart. It's called Hama'apilim. Did you hear that word Ma'apil, Ma'apilim, Ha'apala? These are the people, we don't call them Olim, as we normally call immigrants, although they were immigrants, but the ones who came as clandestine immigrants during the British mandate when the Brits were curtailing the number of Jews, mainly Holocaust survivors, who could come into the country. So there are threefold, fourfold fights. You fight for neighborhoods in the city. You fight for the political right. You fight for entry into the city and you fight to bring in the people. All these topics will come up in the literature. Why is this close to my heart? This is a picture of one of the ship, the boats of those immigrants. And if you look at the lower level, you see a woman figure with a white top. That is my mother who came as a clandestine immigrant in May of 1946. You will need very, very good eyes to see me in the picture because I am hiding in my mom's belly. I was born in October of that year already in Eretz Israel. Therefore, I am a Sabra. Although if you ask my husband, it will, he will tell you, it is true that you were born in Israel, but you were made in Hungary, which makes him right, I'm afraid to tell you, this is the case. But the Mapilim are remembered here as well. Last but not least, and for this I enlarged the map because I'm really asking you, not begging, but almost, that if and when you come back to this neighborhood and you forget everything I told you, you will just seek out this one minimal small street called Michalkei Hamayim Street. Michalkei Hamayim Street, you know Mayim is water. Lechalek Michalkim is distributing the people who distributed the water. Here is the name of the street, you know, as you can see on the sign, Michalke Hamayim. They did not even bother to translate the name, which I find is a little bit funny. Why would a street be named after people who handed out water? So this will take us into the heart of the story. Jerusalem had a minimal reserve of water as it was cut off from the outside sources of water outside the city and mainly the eastern side. So there, are, there is water in water holes collected from winter. There are some wells within the city very deep and there is water coming in cisterns from the coastal plain. Once the water insistence arrived into the city, it needs to be distributed. People will come with these pills and whatever to get their portion of water. Can you imagine the fighting, the bickering, maybe pushing, maybe begging for a little bit extra? They needed very special people who will be just no favoritism, yet will be able to hold the anger, the lack of patience, the anxiety of the people. This is not gold they are handing out. This is water. So honoring that maybe not fighting and combatant role, but such an important, precious role of distributing the water justly to the citizens of Yerushalayim. So that is remembered as well. 
and you will note down when next you go to Yerushalayim, seek out Rehov Mechalkei Abayim and stand there in a moment, remembering that really a role that will not be remembered in history. Who remembers people who handed out water? Well, we do. Let me conclude this part of our tour by going back to the map and you know, you can notice that we are very close to the park already. On the way, as we are entering a park, let us stop for a moment and read a poem by Yuda Amichai, who at that time is not fighting in Jerusalem. Yuda Amichai is a combatant of the Palmach uh, in the southern part of Israel at that time. And uh, this is a poem who he will write not much after that, a few years after that. And that is about the topic of our conversation today, about remembering, lingering memories. Uh, I'm not going to start asking or calling for a reader unless, Ari, you will tell me that you will enjoy reading the English. I can do that with my, you know, Israeli accent. But if you enjoy reading the English and you can do that from the screen, let me do the Ivrit, which I always do when we study poetry. And then you will tell me if you will read it or I shall continue with the English. Are you willing to read, Ari? I am willing to read. I also have some okay. great people online like Leonie Kramer. I wanted to honor her because she helped out last week. So I can ask Leonie. Okay, if she's I'd love to have Leonie read. Okay, That'll be so fun. Leonie, I'm going to so ask let you, me let's do Hebrew right first. Here. Okay. Shehar hazikaron yizkor bimkomi. Ze tafkido. Shehina shehagan lezecher yizkor. Shearechov al shem yizkor. Shehabinyan ayadua yizkor. שבית התפילה על שם אלוהים יזכור, שספר התורה מתגלגל יזכור, שהיזכור יזכור, שהדגלים יזכרו התכריכים הצבעוניים של ההיסטוריה, אשר הגופים שעטפו והפכו אבק, שהאבק יזכור, שהאשפה תזכור בשער, שהשליה תזכור, שחיית השדה ועוף השמיים יאכלו ויזכרו, שכולם יזכרו כדי שאוכל לנוח. ליוני, will you? You will need give, to unmute. Give me a second, I'm trying to find her here to unmute. Okay. ליוני, are you available? I am, thank you. I'm an on, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Let the Memorial Hill remember instead of me. That's what it's here for. Let the park in memory of remember. Let the street that's named for remember. Let the well-known building remember. Let the synagogue that's named after God remember. Let the rolling Torah scroll remember. Let the prayer for the memory of the dead remember. Let the flags remember those multicolored shrouds of history. The bodies they wrapped have long since turned to dust. Let the dust remember. Let the dung remember at the gate. Let the afterbirth remember. Let the beasts of the field and birds of the heavens eat and remember. Let all of them remember so that I can rest. Okay. So here is an amazing voice by Amichai because you, you, you may know and recognize if you know this poet, and I know so many do, how many times we read his poetry in order to remember important days and places and Jerusalem and his modern Kaddish and his more modern El Mayilei Rachamim, et cetera, et cetera. So it's sort of, Amicha, is he tongue in cheek or is he saying actually that he does all this work of remembering or does he just recognize that the whole space of Jerusalem, of Eretz Israel, maybe of other places, Everything around you, the park and the mountain and the Torah scroll and the synagogue and the home that you erected in memory of and the museum that turns to dust because there is a certain tiredness. I cannot do it anymore. I want to rest. I need to stop remembering. Memories are heavy in Jerusalem, sometimes too heavy. 
And here is a moment by Amichai that says, I need to rest. Oddly enough, even in a poem where he's asking for rest, you can see at least one quote that reminds us of a, the creation of the world. And I am reading the Ivrit for you and Leoni, if you can do, if you can read from the screen. Leoni. And man named all the cattle and the fowl of the heavens and all the beasts of the field. But for man, he did not find a helpmate opposite him. Thank you. So you can see that even for the roles that Amichai assigns to all those other entities that need to remember so that he, the human being, can rest, cannot be replaced, he will go to a quote from the book of Genesis. So even when he wants to put down memory and tradition <laughs> And everything, actually, he embraces it. Because even from this poem where he says, leave me alone already, he is deeply rooted in text, which is what we read in order to remember. So Amichai, to me, at his best, with his, listen to me carefully to make sure you understand what I am saying. Okay? Rina, Rina so is, wants to know when this uh, poem was written. I can look it up and send it to you right now because I don't remember exactly in which of the books, but I can find it out easily as I have the full uh, Alterman just as I, you know, my arm touches it already, but I don't want to do it in class. But I just tell you that if you have to happen to have the whole Amichai, then on the fifth volume at the end, you have a list with the opening lines of all the poems, and it will tell you in which book, and the books are chronological, so you can find that easily. And I will do that and email it to you, Ari, and we can post it. And thank you as we go. And finally, we are going to meet the two poets uh, that uh, their art uh, is indeed connected to this park. So the first one is Yoram Kanyuk. And you can see that when he was born and when he passed away almost eight years ago. And I want to start entering the work of Yoram Kanyuk. Yoram Kanyuk is no male shall live. He is not as readable. Heavy duty. It's not a page turner. I always joke that maybe the biggest or easiest way to understand the difference is that Yoram Kanyuk is a yeki. <laughs> you know, he comes from, <laughs> yeah, Leone, you're laughing. I know, I know that. He comes from this, you know, heavy duty German Jewish tradition and it transpires in his writing, although to the best of my knowledge, he never wrote in German. He wrote in Hebrew from the beginning. He was a Palmachnik, a fighter in the War of Independence, and many wars later, and then became a very liberal left-wing thinker, went back to Germany and tried to deal with Holocaust and post-Holocaust memory, a very complex writer. I'll be quoting from a book that I will show you in a minute, which is available in English. I try in session like this, not to a quote text that only I have the translation, but something that is accessible. And from all his sayings in the book 1948 that we are going to look at in a moment, this is, I think, a, the line or the sentence that best gives you the spirit of things. There was a war and I was wounded. When I came back, I was sitting for days disconnected from everything. I didn't speak for days. I was drawing on the walls because I have killed people before I kissed a woman. And I'd like to even step out of my text, although I will not be able to see all of you, but at least I have a sense of seeing some of you whose video cameras are turned on. I know that oftentimes in big speeches, memorials, we speak about the soldiers who fought bravely, about soldiers who paid with their life. 
And in nowadays, we already know and recognize that even those who survived and even those who were not physically wounded, many came back with post-traumatic experiences that lingered, if we speak about lingering. But Yoram Kanyuk did not belong to that generation where you could speak about post-trauma. You needed to be, a, I don't even know that the term existed in Israeli society after the War of Independence and maybe not even after 56 and maybe not even after 67. I can recognize echoes in it in post-67 poetry, but not yet in the professional world. So Yoram Kanyuk is one of the first and the earliest to say, forget our heroism. Forget the fact that we helped create a state. Many of us continued living under the shadow of the post-trauma. And his blatant way of giving it a name, this phenomenon that, phenomenon that he doesn't even know how to name because the terminology did not exist at that early page. I did not speak for days. I was drawing on the walls. Why? Not because I had PTSD. Because I have killed people before I kissed a woman. This is a young man. He is 19 at the time or 20. And this is how he sums up the experience. It is connected to San Simon and to his experience there in that battle. Okay. The book we are reading from is called 1948 by Yoram Kanyuk. And for those of you who read Hebrew, Tashach, which is the Hebrew date, Tafshin Chet, for 1948. So both exist, Hebrew and English. And I'm telling you again, it's not Mer Shalem, but it's a worthwhile read. And let us open the book and start reading a little bit from it, just a little. Let me just take it from the top and then on each page, we're not reading all of this. And I sent you all the text on which I based my session today so that you can read it in your own time. This is the opening of the book, 1948, which literally, uh, Yoram Kanyuk here adopted a form that I'm not sure is true, but it exists in literature. When the poet tells you, I found these old notes that I had somewhere in a backpack or in a shelf. I have not looked at it for many years, and now I just rewrote it, but it's really the things that I wrote back then. This is a kind of a cliche that we do not have to fully accept. Because when you read the book, it's not a 19-year-old writing. This has a lot of hindsight, but let's believe him, okay? Throughout the days of the fighting, I didn't think, I did not make plans. I did what I was told and took initiative only when there was no choice and we had, no, we had to improvise. I was told to sleep, I slept. I was told to get up, I got up. They gave out food, I ate. When they didn't, I wasn't hungry. I was evidently, uh, it was evidently true that they put sodium bicarbonate in the small quantity of water we were given to drink because I didn't think about girls. So I don't know how medically this is true that if they put that material in your water, it stops you from having all those uh, sexual thoughts, but this is what they believed in the army even when I served there. Uh, from all this page, I would like to show you and to highlight just one thing, and this is it. Except for me, there weren't any youngster who had previously worked in youth movements. They would be called up later, after we finished establishing a state for them. We were just one from here and another from there. We still had no documents whatsoever except for the Palestinian birth certificates. Why did I highlight this line? Again, because of 
prototypes because of way of thinking. We talk about people going into the Palmach and being in Zionist youth movements and then being called up to serve. And what Yoram can you? He said, yes, these fancy, maybe spoiled chevre of the youth movements, they came in later after we established, we were finished establishing a state for them. It was us, the school dropouts, one from here, one from there, who joined the fighting forces at the beginning. Do not accept all these heroic descriptions. Some of them, us did not really know what they were doing. The only document we had was a birth certificate. They didn't graduate from school. They were doing it because it was needed to be done, because they were called, because somebody suggested they might. But Yoram Kanyuk drops the whole ideology that we all have all the time and says it, it was way more complex than that. So just try to remember these couple of lines from here. As we turn to the next page, again, I just want to highlight one paragraph from all of it. And it's all yours to read. I sent it to Ari. He explains the experience of how uh, he was leaving his parents' home with the German library, etc., and he's joining the Palmach to bring those clandestine immigrants in. This is what happened to us. We went off to bring Jews by sea and ended up establishing a state in the Jerusalem hills. It's a mistake to think that we fought for the establishment of the state. How were we to know how you establish a state? Had anybody done it before us? Nonsense. A Jewish state was the blast snatched from the shofar of others. And yes, somehow with the power of a miracle that was actually the act, the sound of the shofar reached its destination. The first thing we know about the history of our people was the patriarch Abraham, etc., etc. And how did we know to establish a state? We had no idea. When you talk about us and say they established a state, give me a break. I didn't know about establishing states, and neither my comrades. We haven't had the foggiest idea. They told us to bring those miserable olim. Did they? We did, and then on the way they told us to do other stuff. Let us turn another page before we leave Yoram Kanyuk, because now we are in the park. And as we are seated there around me and we are reading the early lines of Yoram Kanyuk, I'll be asking you to raise your eyes and look at where we are. And there in front of us is this Greek Orthodox monastery. And the flag that is flying on top of it is not the Israeli flag. It's the Greek flag. Is the flag of Greece, and it's there to this day. These are recent pictures, not from 48. And it was there then, and it is there now. In this monastery, there are nuns, Greek Orthodox. Next to it, there is a small sort of hostel of the monastery. And in that hostel, not at the time of the fight, but about a decade before, the poet Shaul Chernichovsky lived. Why did he move there? Shaul Chernichovsky was married to a Christian woman. The marriage did not work out that well. And at a certain point, she, she wanted to leave Tel Aviv and come and, and live in the monastery, not become a nun, just live there. She was happier there. She didn't like the whole hustle and bustle of Tel Aviv and the Zionists and the state and the wars. She wanted the peace of quiet of the monastery. He loved her. So he came and rented the room in that hostel and just lived across the alley from where his wife was. And we will come back to that because Yaron Kanyuk will mention him, Meir Shalev will mention him. We all know that one of our greatest poets actually at a certain time lived here. You know, it's not such a great point in Jewish history. And when the a banknote 
with Shaul Chanikhovsky's image came out, there was a great opposition by the ultra-Orthodox because of the fact that he was married to a non-Jewish woman. But this is not what I want to look at on this page. There are two things, two items. And in one, what is important to me is the language. I don't remember when we went out to the slaughter mistakenly called the Battle of San Simon Monastery. You know, Theorem Kanyuk, this is a language telling the history of the War of Independence totally robbed and unveiled from any romantic, nationalist, ideological, state-building language. They took us, it was a slaughterhouse. There were three rounds of battle. Jews were inside trying because they, they actually conquered the monastery in the first round and then the Arabs attacked and attacked again. And they were one after the other getting wounded and dying inside as wave after wave of Arabs from the Catamon being reinforced by others are coming. And for the young people participating in that battle, the ones who killed people before kissing a woman, this was a slaughterhouse. So a couple of more lines here. I did not take part in the first attack. I think I'd been asked to sort ammunition and I remember feeling guilty about not being there. Some of my friends were, and one of them came back and gave me a watch that belonged to a guy who had died because mine was broken. And the watch that belonged to the dead friend had leather cover so it wouldn't shine in dark. I did take part in the second attack. Okay. So here is how he gets into the battle and you can hear again and again the lack of, you know, cause and mission and romantic statement, just the, the really the gory details and that part. Memories, you remember he's coming back to these lost notes from before. There was a cloister with just a few meters separating us from the enemy. And we had to run between the lower wall and the monastery building. It was like being in a tunnel of death and people were dropping every minute, dead or wounded. I saw two young women in the entrance. They said they were nuns. I didn't remember seeing them earlier. Dado, later to become the chief of staff in the Yom Kippur War, commander there on the ground in that battle, ran upward and I looked for a cigarette. Somebody fired at me and I crouched. The bullet hit one of the women who said, who'd said they were nuns. I looked at her. The shot shook her body. Her gray dress was cut to ribbons. Someone yelled at me to come up. Then he died and fell at my feet. All this time we could hear the savage screams of the attackers. A pall of smoke rose from the flames. I went back down again because somebody called me, but he fell wounded. When I got back, the nuns' clothes had been pulled up. That was the first time I had seen a female nudity. So you can see what I am offering you with Yoram Kanyuk. It's not for everybody. It's a very in-depth, soul-searching of his role in that glory of the War of Independence and also the constant comparison between killing, dying, and sexual awareness awareness of yourself as a man. Can you imagine he will tell you when he is 18 that the first time I saw a woman, it was a dead nun and I was 18 and we were fighting to create a state in that slaughterhouse that was called San Simon. This is his memory. It's a beautiful part, by the way, if you go today. Let us switch tone and use the last 10 minutes that we have to come back to Meir Shaliv. And Really, his book, A Pigeon and the Boy, I don't want to read too much of it for you today because I want you to read it if you haven't done so. And this whole book circles around a story, a fictional story, couldn't be true, 
that Meir Shalev created on the basis of true fact that happened in this battle. So in the battle of San Simon was one of the times during the War of Independence that the nascent or not yet born IDF was using homing pigeons. And they had a special person in every unit that was carrying a dove cart on his shoulders, on his back, and freeing the homing pigeons to go back to base with whatever information as part of, you know, the intelligence service of wartime. It is around this fact that Meir Shalev is weaving the story. I am not doing any spoilers. So we are opening the book and I want you just to notice the point of view because we have two points of view that are extremely important and relevant to you who are sitting all over these screens right now. The narrator voice in The Pigeon and the Boy is a tour guide. And I think that's important for sure to the Israeli audience, but not less to the American and the American Jewish audience, because oftentimes you get a view of Israel through the tour guides that are leading you. And the tour guide's perspective is important. Also, he, it does not need to be ideological. It's sometimes just the choice of where to stop and how to ask you to send or to sit and what to look at that he's already creating an impression. So we know about this tour guide, later to be known with his name, etc. We are not going there, that he chose to bring this particular group to San Simon which is not a tourist place normally. So from the beginning, you get the sense there is something special here. And indeed, note the opening line of the book. And suddenly, okay? And suddenly, said the elderly American man, man in the white shirt. So our narrator is the tour guide. But he is now echoing one of the visitors. He doesn't have his name. Tour guides not always remember all the names of the group, but he knows he's an American. And we will get now the point of view of the American. And suddenly, said the elderly American in the white shirt, suddenly a pigeon flew overhead above that hell. Hmm. Notice the choice of words. Did Meir Shalev read Meir Kanyuk, who came where, way before him? Did he create this American visitor who is obviously a former Israeli who left Israel and comes back after so many years and insists on visiting Seth Simon? And now that he is there, he remembers. And suddenly, said the elderly American man in the white shirt, suddenly a pigeon flew overhead above that hell. Everyone fell silent. His unexpected Hebrew and the pigeon that had alighted from his mouth surprised all present. Even those who could not understand what he was saying. A pigeon? A pigeon? Can you visualize yourself in a group of tourists in the park in Israel? Somebody stops the tour guide and said, suddenly start reminiscing. He knows this place. Something had happened to him, but what? A pigeon. The man, stout and suntanned, as only Americans can be, with moccasins on his feet and the mane of white hair on his head pointed to the turret of the monastery. We are sitting there, we just saw it, and now we can see it through the eyes of Mary Shalev. Many years had passed, but there were a few things he still remembered about the terrible battle that had taken place there. And forgetting them, he declared, is something I will never be able to do. 
not only the fatigue and the horror, not only the victory, a victory that took both sides by surprise, he noted, but also the minor details, the ones those importance become apparent only later. For one, the stray bullets, or perhaps they were intentional, that stuck the bell of the monastery on occasion, right here, this very bell. And then the bell would ring sharply, an odd sound that sank, then abated, but continued to resound in the darkness for a long while. A strange sound, sharp at first, and high pitched like even the bell was surprised. Then it got weaker, in pain, but not dead, until the next shot hit it. One of our wounded guys said, bells are used to the getting hit from the inside, not the outside. So join me in standing there in the park of San Simon so many years later. And then you do your business as a tour guide. Actually, this particular tour guide is expert on leading tours of people who are bird watchers. And so it's so very appropriate that the pigeon will come in at the opening at the story and you will need to read the whole novel in order to understand the crucial importance of the pigeon here in this story. I think I would like to stop here with our story and take you to the end of my PowerPoint presentation where I bring you back to Shaul Chernichovsky. Shaul Chernichovsky at a very early phase, way before the Battle of San Simon, way before the stories we have read, wrote a poem called, I believe, or Credo, or oftentimes with the Latin name, Anima Amin. Many a time, when debate comes up in Israel about the fact that our national anthem, Hatikva, is not exactly representative of all the citizens of the state of Israel, as it talks about the Jewish soul and the Jewish heart palpitating. And what can I tell you? Not all Israeli citizens, they all have hearts, but not all their hearts are Jewish. It sometimes come up the suggestion of maybe adopting this particular song that talks about the beauty and freedom of the human spirit a, to replace maybe one day the national anthem. It hasn't happened yet. I don't see it happening tomorrow, but this is the standing of this poem. This is like, these are like two stanzas, two verses out of, I think, 10 that the poem has. And uh, Leonie, I'll be asking you to read the English after I read the Ivrit. Sachaki, Sachaki, ala chalomot zu ani hacholim sach. Sachaki, ki baadam amin, ki odeni maamin bach. Ki od nafshi dror shoefet lo mechartia le egil paz. Ki od amin gam baadam gam berucho roach az. English, please. Rejoice, rejoice now in the dreams. I, the dreamer, am he who speaks. Rejoice, for I'll have faith in mankind, for in mankind I believe. For my soul still yearns for freedom. I've not sold it to a calf of gold, for I shall yet have faith in mankind, in its spirit great and bold. So these are the words of Shaul Chernichovsky, the man who opted to live by the monastery that later becomes the place of such a terrible battle, and now just a peaceful park in the heart of a beautiful neighborhood of Jerusalem that we hardly understand the importance of. Let me pull out of my PowerPoint presentation and share with you one of the many renditions of this beautiful poem set to music. Uh, we will be listening to Arik Levi, just a minute of it to conclude our class.
ספקי ספקי על החלומות, זו אני החולם סף. ספקי כי בא אדם אמין, כי יודני מאמין בך. ספקי כי בא אדם אמין, כי יודני מאמין בך. כי עוד נפשי דרור שואפת, לא מכרתי על עגל פז. כי עוד אמין גם באדם, גם ברוחו רוח עז. כי עוד אמין גם באדם, גם ברוחו רוח עז. רוחו ישליך קו להבל, ירום ממנו בומות אייל. לא ברעב ימות עובד, דרור לנפש פת לדל. לא ברעב ימות עובד, דרור לנפש פת לדל. We will stop this here and I'll be pulling out of my PowerPoint presentation to conclude this hike, virtual hike, uh, with a su suggestion. First of all, to read A Pigeon and the Boy, if you have the stomach for it, even 1948 by Yoram Kanyuk. And for sure, make sure that although it's not a great tourist attraction, to visit the neighborhood of Katamon and the park of the monastery of San Simon, and maybe bring with you some of the reading and read it on the spot. To Darabach, I will take your comments and questions now as they come. Thank you. Thank you for the virtual teal. It was nice to uh, feel the Jerusalem air, smell the smells, and um, learn about a part of the city that um, I know a little bit about, but now I know much more about. So here's the first question. Do we know why it's called Katamon? Oh, yeah, why, my goodness. You'll have to look it up in Wikipedia. I read and I now forgot. It, it's not a Hebrew name. It's, it, it, it comes from the Arabic because it, it was an Arab neighborhood. Okay, uh, no worries. While, while we're talking, I'm having our CSP participants uh, look it up. And the first Second. person to give me the answer will get a free item in our T CSP uh, online store okay. T-shirt. So. See who comes first with the right answer. Okay, um, when did when did these streets get their names? In other words, how far how long after independence were these all these? Streets? I I am going to say not very long, but it took a while. It took a while because there is a committee for naming streets, but I would say for sure way before sixty seven. Okay, this is the neighborhood that was part of Jerusalem. Before 67, since 48, this is because the fighters of Catamon. This is because the Battle of San Simon, that this belongs to the Jerusalem city, even in the early 19, uh, first 19 years of the state of Israel. So it must have been probably the first decade of the state of Israel, I'm going to say. So Marcia says the name Catamon is Greek for below the monastery. So that would tie into this whole program. Uh, due to the San uh, Simon Monastery located in the neighborhood, the Hebrew name for Katamon, Gonen, he is Gonen, is, Gonen uh, is featured on some street signs, but almost never used in conversation. So, uh, Marsha, email me and I will um, set you up with your yeah, favorite. We call item it Katamon. Us. We know it's called Gonen in Hebrew, and nobody uses it. Um, we've yeah. had quite, a, we have some people who actually live there. So, there's Jack who lives in, um, um, let's see, what street? Uh, Port Seam, number 27. So, if you're in Jerusalem, go by Jack. Knock the door and say, hi, Jack, show me around your neighborhood. And then um, one of our longtime CSP donors and board member, Beverly Jacobs, her daughter lived in the area. And I asked, Be I asked Beverly in the chat, and I'll ask the same question to you. Do Israelis know where they live? Do Israelis who, come, who live in Jerusalem know what these streets mean? Or is it more something that we learn because we have a class with you? Well, I will say the following. People 
of my acquaintance who live there. Like the first name that comes to mind is of course the poet uh, Shlomit Naor, whose poetry I taught. So we led a tour of Katamon with her poetry written today. This is the, uh, an age group that is the age of my kids. So 40 something, 50 something, they know. The educated, the people who care about where they live, they do. If the kids know, I'm not sure. Is it taught in school? Maybe through projects that kids need to do. I think it would depend a lot on parents as you walk with your kids in your neighborhood. Do you tell them about the names of the street? Because they're pretty obvious, you know, once you read them, the question will come up. So what does it mean, the distributors of water? Why, mom? And then you will have either to look it up or say, I would say that there is a general knowledge. How much to the detail? I'm not sure. This period is taught in high school, uh, in the history of Israel uh, courses that kids take. So the period of 48, 47, 48, 49, the War of Independence is part of the modern history, modern Jewish history that kids will study. But that will come in high school. I know that when I do go to Jerusalem in particular, and even Tel Aviv, I look at the street names and I, I, you know, I enjoy the names. I mean, I, I generally they're names of people, and um, yeah. I recognize the names in either Aviv, from ancient Jewish history so, yeah. or contemporary. This is a very special neighborhood with all these names that all are linked to one period, and it's very small indeed. You can walk it in eighteen minutes if you didn't stop by each sign to read and tell the stories. Just walk; it will not take you more than eighteen minutes, and I take over an hour when I lead people there. What would be cool if they don't have it yet is, you know, many, many people have technology where they've set up the stories. And mm -hmm. as you walk, you have it on your phone so you could hear cool. the poetry and stuff. So if they haven't done it, we'll add it to your list of to do's, your, okay. your long list. Um, yeah. So um, anything uh, you told us a story once about when you were giving a tour uh, and you were talking about Yudha Michai's poetry that some guy walked up holding his bags and sat and oh, enjoyed the tour. Oh, that's not here. That's in the I other know. tour, in the Amichai right. tour. And it yeah, was Yudha Amichai. Yeah, right. when it... Amichai show, showed up when we read Tourist, it actually happened. Yeah. Do, do, has anything strange happened on when you're giving any, this particular tour? Has anybody showed up? And... Something very personal that I'm not sure I want to share right now, but I was leading a tour uh, with a group from New Jersey and, and you know, you don't know and from a synagogue in New Jersey that came to Hartman and they asked for this tour. And one of the people was a physician, a doctor, and he diagnosed something that I had. And because of that, I had surgery and uh, which was not diagnosed by my doctor. Wow. Well, it's like yeah, so that's like having just It did happen in this tour. So I always think of Dr. Goodman of New Jersey when I'm on that tour. Well, had I known, we would have dedicated this program. From synagogue here. Right. Well, um, had I known, we would have dedicated this program in his honor or memory. I don't know if he's still alive. What, what synagogue does he belong oh, to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Goodman, for sure. I even visited his home a couple of years ago. Um, so people are, oh, someone asked, where is your family from in Hungary? Oh, that's a complicated story. Remember that you ask, so I will tell you very quickly. Mom is from Budapest. And I was always interested only in the Budapest part because my parents got married immediately after World War II. A, the marriage was not a great success. By the time I'm two, they are in Israel, they get divorced. My father leaves, goes to Argentina, starts a new family. Mom marries a, the person who is the father who raised me and the father of my sister, Ilana. And he's from a part of Hungary called Haidu Bessermain. It's the southern part of Hungary. And then I'm never interested in the history of my biological father until five or six years ago when I reestablished contacts with his youngest daughter from that other marriage. And he is originally from Beraksas, which is now the Ukraine. It was the Eastern border of the Austro-Hungarian empire. So my family comes from all over. And just for fun, 
that sister, Veronica, who is originally from Argentina, which is where my biological father went after he divorced my mom, now lives in Canada. And right as we speak, she is here with us in Tel Aviv. We lit, lit the first candle together. And had she not made it by Friday, I don't think that she would have made this trip now. And we, she's traveling to Jerusalem tomorrow, and we are going to have a large family event on Shabbat with all of us. So yes, that's a little bit of the story of my family. By it the way, if you are reading A Pigeon and the Boy, but please read it first. And I will send the information to Alec. I did a book club on A Pigeon and the Boy, and all the lectures of that book club are recorded and you can access them after you read the book for maybe better insights into the book. So I will send you the links to the Pigeon and the Boy lectures uh, for people who want to read a uh, Pigeon and the Boy. Okay, okay. As, as we wrap up two things. And I was in New York last weekend. I, I really went to visit and spend time with uh, Emma, my, my child who lives there in the Upper West Side. And we did go, one of, her, one of Emma's favorite places is the Hungarian pastry shop up in the upper, upper uh -huh. side. So I was thinking of you when I was there um, and eating, enjoying my poppy seed treats. Uh, Tom Barth asks, who lives in Katamon today? Like, how would you describe the population there today? Is it a you certain know, segment of Israeli class, society? Is middle it? class, upper middle class, on the verge of Katamon and the German colony, you will have also, did you see the Israeli sitcom Srugim? The knitted kippot about the modern Orthodox and the date, etc. Those yeah. have <laughs> live in that area as well. So modern Orthodox, lots of American immigrants, a uh, lots of a uh, young modern Orthodox, the Tilo me kids, you know that kind of population. So if you're in Israel and you are have listened to this program, please, you know, when it's light, go walk to the park, send us a picture, send me a picture of you in the park. We'll put it up on our CSP. A CSP okay. If you have a CSP hat or, or a t-shirt, yeah. that's even better, but mm -hmm. maybe you don't. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. Just send me the picture so that um, we can uh, enjoy being there with you, even though we can't literally be, with, be there with you. So thank you so much for this virtual to you. I think we're going to have you back. Tell us what we're going to learn when we go to Tal Piot and, uh, and learn about Agnon. What's our so next I, adventure I going to be? So I offered an Agnon tour, which will take us to two stops. A, one of them will be through the promenade overlooking the city. And we will study an Agnon text there as looking at the city. Uh, and excerpts from his a novella, one should say, Tehila. And then we will walk to the Agnon house and we will read about a, we read from a story that tells the story of building that house in Talpiot at the time. Okay, so an Agnon tour. It's not really a scholarly Agnon reading, but a fun Agnon tour in Yerushalayim. Okay, in parts of Yerushalayim that are connected to the Agnon story. Great, so we're looking forward to that. I want to wish... Rachel, a happy Urchag, Urim Sameach, because it's uh, Hanukkah there already. I want to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah for this evening. We are heading out. I'm going to take the kids to a Hanukkah celebration shortly in Orange County, and then we'll light the candles. They are very excited to see what presents they got. They're hoping it's not a T-shirt from the CSP store. Uh -huh. It's not. <laughs> Someone is banging <laughs> stuff in the walls downstairs. I have no idea what they're putting up. I'll find out in a few minutes. Thank you all for joining us today. And um, if you have great ideas for t-shirts for our store, send to me. I'm working on a line of, of poetry, uh, po Israeli poets. So I was talking to Rachel about it. I so stay tuned. the four great ones. You know, the Bialik, Alterman, Leah Goldberg, and Amichai that we are doing this uh, uh, winter. And if you want to be, I emailed you twice about with Rachel's email. If you're not on her list to join the poetry class and you're interested in mm -hmm. Rachel, Please join do. the class. It really is. It's special. And it's amazing. It's it's the one of the first online programs that went viral. I would say, um, when uh, the pandemic shut everything else down. So Leone's saying you should join. She's um yeah she's a person who's discovered she's the class. She's been there forever. <laughs> yeah, and not only poetry. We also have musicians in each class. So good. <laughs> okay. so, and 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 people so, are saying how terrific you are, Rachel, uh, Mona. Am I allowed Mona. one more sentence? Sure, go for it. 
So there are many, many people among you who, while I was ill and in hospital and surgery, kept me on your Mishaberach list. So I figure if last week I did a face-to-face -to -face tour of Yad Vashem, and yesterday I swam in the ocean, it is safe to take me off your Mishaberach list. Thank you very much. They worked. Take me off. Pray for other people. Tudah Raba. Chag Sameach. Chag Urim Sameach, everybody. Keep safe. Keep well. If you want to learn about who really won at Hanukkah, the Greeks, the Jews, join us tomorrow. Clive Lawton live from England. <laughs> Clive is always very, uh, uh, takes things very interesting direction. Clive so is great. Looking forward. Send we, me the link for Clive. I'll try to join. Okay. If you join, we'll, we'll uh, definitely um, recognize you there. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Be safe. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Terrific class. Bye.